Hi, my name is Jenny Roan, and I'm a cell biologist at University College London. Bacteria have been on the planet for billions of years longer than we have. Because of this, despite their tiny, tiny size, they're very good at infecting us. And I'm interested in how bad bacteria can trick us and, and make us sick. So one area where bacteria have the upper hand is in patients who have received a donor kidney. Up to two-thirds of all kidney transplant recipients will experience a urinary tract infection, or UTI for short. This can cause loss of the donated kidney, sepsis, and even death. So as such, it has a huge healthcare economic cost and human cost. So the problem of antimicrobial resistance is actually making it worse for kidney transplant patients. So what is AMR, or antimicrobial resistance? So when bacteria are dividing like these, they can be killed by antibiotics, zap, but bacteria can actually express a gene that prevents this from happening. It's like a defense shield, and that's what antimicrobial resistance is. So in the donor kidney environment, um, you can see here the, the kidney is attached to the bladder, so the urine can come out. But you have to keep in mind the environment in which this happens, and that's in very close proximity to the gut. So the opening to the gut is very close to the opening to the bladder. Within the gut, of course, there's lots of bacteria. Most of them are friendly, these green guys, but occasionally a bad one will pop up, one that has an AMR gene. And then these guys have a propensity to travel, so they'll creep across the skin, up into the urethra, cause a urinary tract infection. And some of these ascend even further into the donor kidney and cause a kidney infection and then even sepsis after that. So this is when things get really life-threatening. So we're going to do a study with, with patients who've received donor kidneys. And we're going to attempt to inspect the bacteria in the gut, in the bladder, and, and kidney and blood when they get infected to see what's so happening. So how will the study work? Well, first, the patients will come in for their kidney transplant. The doctors, Reza and Mark, and their clinical team will take stool, urine, and blood samples before transplant, at transplant, and then one month, three months, six months, and a year afterwards, so we can track them in time. The biologists, Amber and Sanchita, will work up the samples, extract the bacteria's DNA, and work out their genetic blueprints. The computational biologists, Lucy and Francois, will study the blueprints to see where the good and bacteria are at any given snapshot in time, work out their signatures of AMR, and, and hopefully we'll find patterns in the bad ones and can work out how to recognize them. So what's the ultimate goal? Personalized medicine for kidney transplant patients, an early warning system. We can check the patient's stools early for the presence of the bad bugs, so the doctors can try to eliminate them with drugs before they start their migration up the bladder and beyond to cause all those problems. Our hope is that this will ultimately save donor kidneys and patients' lives. The overuse of antibiotics has caused uh, a very big problem for the healthcare industry as bacteria has developed some resistance to these antibiotics uh, and, it, and thus making it even harder to treat. And this causes many deaths uh, per year in, uh, in Europe and the world in general. And to tackle this problem of antimicrobial resistance to um, antibiotics is to try and kill bacteria before they can infect people so that less people need antibiotics. Um, and one way we could do this is uh, using jewelry. So the common item which is used in jewelry is gold. Gold is not only pretty, but it also displays fascinating properties when they are at nanoscale. At nanoscale, uh, basically which is 10 raised to power minus nine of a meter, the atoms become so small that most of them are on the surface and they start to exhibit very different properties as compared to bulk, basically in jewelry or in gold bars, what we see. Uh, and in the at the bulk, they are, uh, unreactive, but at nanoscale, they become very reactive. Or not only that, this they have an ability to kill bacteria. Kill bacteria instead, they exhibit this some type of species 
that basically can kill the bacteria. In this figure on the left side, you can see the gold nanoparticles uh, in on, uh, of different sizes. Uh, so when they are in a different size, as I said, they exhibit fascinating properties. They exhibit different colors also. And smaller they are, better uh, antimicrobial properties they exhibit. In the center, they, uh, we, uh, we can see the image of gold nanoparticles on polymer brushes. So basically, this is a technique which we are using to dwell to develop and tackle the issue of antimicrobial resistance basically killing the bacteria onto the surfaces itself and the reason we use polymer brushes polymer brushes being uh, polymer chains that are attached to a surface they're a way to uh, change the properties of a bulk material so if you had steel you can grow this polymer brush without really changing the bulk properties but the surface properties of this are different um, and through this we have seen a very significant reduction in E. coli um, over in just just an hour period which is uh, very promising um, many other studies that are similar have been using um, other uh, metals such as gold silver copper and they only see reduction in um, at least two or three hours, some even 24 hours. So this is very promising. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Hi, I'm Dimitrios Evangelopoulos, and my project title is Investigation of Drug Synergy and Rational Design of Drug Combinations. Antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time. Infections that once could be treated are, can now be fatal. With a limited number of new antibacterial drugs being developed, it is important to identify ways to maximize the lifetime of the existing drugs, to save our drugs. In our research project, we study the use of different drug combinations to kill resistance bacteria. Combination therapy will become the norm in the near future, as treating bacterial infections with a single antibiotic will be less and less frequent due to the current resistance making them redundant. We are planning to identify drugs that work better in a combination than in isolation. To achieve this, we will first test the capacity of single drugs and drug combinations to kill bacteria in the lab. We will then examine the development of resistance to drug combinations using the best identified combinations. In a model of human infection known as the hollow fiber system seen here in the bottom left. A simple cartridge containing several tiny tubes where bacteria and drug amounts can mimic what really happens inside our bodies. But we also want to find out what the drug combination treatment means for the bacteria. And for this, we're going to monitor the changes and the dynamics of gene expression from DNA to RNA, and also analyzing the chemical processes by measuring the wide number of metabolic products in the bacterial cells known, known as metabolites, and this is what you can see in, in the panels in the bottom right, where single drugs and drug combination have a completely different response and the different metabolic pathways that are involved are different. This will look like trying to find out the bacterial traffic map system and the way they interact during a drug combination therapy. Think of trying to identify which traffic lights go on and which are going off based on the different drug treatments. Throughout this project, we will be able to predict which drug combinations will work best and how these combinations achieve superior bacterial killing. But most importantly, our findings will contribute towards the increased clinical lifetimes of our current and viable antibiotics. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jack Lee and I'm a research assistant at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children and I'm here to talk to you about our research project. Water is a very basic fundamental of life. We drink it, we wash with it, and sometimes we use it for fun and games. But for some people, water isn't quite so straightforward. Here at GOSH, we often treat patients with chronic diseases, and one of those is called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, or CF for short, is a disease which can affect the whole body but is most visible in the lungs, where it prevents patients from clearing mucus properly. This can lead to serious infections that are difficult to treat due to the way the disease works. 
one of the main treatments for CF is a lung transplant. But if the patient already has an infection, the transplant doesn't work well and the recovery can be highly impacted. One of the most serious infections is caused by bacteria that can live in both humans and in the environment, such as in soil or in water. These bacteria are called non-tuberculous mycobacteria, or NTM. This means bacteria related to tuberculosis, but that aren't actually tuberculosis. They can, however, be just as resilient, so we really prefer to prevent infections if at all possible. One of the main ways CF patients can be infected is from the environment. We believe this is primarily through contact with water. At the moment, CF patients have to be really careful around water sources, which means they might not be able to play in or with water, or be more careful when showering or bathing. For our research project, we are looking at water sources in our hospital, including medical equipment used in surgery, as well as sources like sinks, showers and bathtubs. We will be testing the water for NTM, both using culture on plates, which can tell us if they are alive, and using a test called PCR, which will tell us if they were there, regardless of whether or not the bacteria have died. Then we're going to ask the public to send in water samples from their homes, or even from schools and other environments. We will then try and decide what the actual risk for cystic fibrosis patients is, and then advise guidelines for the future, which may allow young people with cystic fibrosis to play with water as other children do. We hope this research will also reduce the use of antibiotics and, in the future, reduce the rise of antibiotics resistance that we face. Thank you for listening. I think that there is a bit of David Attenborough in all of us. And for me, it's what makes the study of bacteria so fascinating. Their different mechanisms for survival and abilities to adapt to stress. I'd like to focus on one particularly special group of bacteria called mycobacteria. Special because they have adopted a very different strategy for survival compared with most other bacteria. These are tortoises in a world of hares. Whereas most bacteria divide every 20 to 30 minutes so that after an hour you already have eight children or after a day upwards of 60,000 offspring, mycobacteria will perhaps divide just once or twice in a whole day. What price can be worth paying such a huge price for? The answer is, like the tortoise, virtual indestructibility. These organisms expend much energy on constructing envelopes that are immensely resilient to the outside world, which means that they not only do occupy some of the most inhospitable ecological niches, but are also, unfortunately for us, incredibly resistant to both human defence systems and antibiotics. Two species within this group you may have already heard about, tuberculosis and leprosy, but increasingly some of the other so-called non-tuberculous mycobacteria are causing very serious human disease. And there is one such that is the most problematic, Mycobacterium abscessus, causing both severe disfiguring abscesses that usually require surgery to achieve cure, but also progressive lung infections, most commonly in those with cystic fibrosis or chronic lung scarring, something that we may unfortunately start to see much more of now after COVID. The reason our research project is focusing on Mycobacterium abscessus is threefold. Infection rates are increasing, it is virtually incurable by medicines alone, and because we have major problems in the laboratory using traditional methods to work out which antibiotics are effective against a patient's strain. The tests just don't work. But very recently, a new lab model has been developed called the hollow fiber system that allows continuous trichation of the concentration of drugs surrounding the study bacteria using calibrated flow instead of static test tubes in a way that much more accurately reflects what's happening in our bodies at a cellular level. Also, and this is critically important for mycobacterial work, it allows different drugs to be put together to work out which combinations and in what doses work best. So our group will be amongst the first in the world to use this new and incredibly powerful tool to test out the most promising new drugs 
against clinical strains of abscesses taken from our patients. And we hope that this will lead directly to improvements in our ability to provide treatment and care for this group of patients. Hello, my name is Patrick and I'm a PhD student at the UCL Institute of Health Informatics. The next three minutes, I'm going to talk about the P that you see here on the slide and the bacteria that may or may not be in it. So why am I interested in the bacteria in this urine? Because it plays a central role in diagnosing urinary tract infections. Most of you might be familiar with urinary tract infections. They are among the most common infections after all, and particularly if you are a woman, there's a good chance that you had at least one of them in your life. Given how annoying they can be if you have one, it might come as a bit of a surprise of how difficult they can be to diagnose reliably. And this lack of certainty is a problem. When doctors are unsure whether you do or do not have a urinary tract infection, they often opt to give you antibiotics nevertheless, just to make sure you don't develop more severe and life-threatening infection. Doing this in one or two patients isn't a big deal. However, if we do this too often and too liberally, it may become a major driver of antibiotic resistance, something we all here at this festival try to avoid. So why is it difficult to diagnose urinary tract infections? In short, the tools that we currently have aren't ideal. Besides asking you about your general symptoms, doctors usually perform a range of tests on your pee, the very one that you see here on the slide. They put a little paper strip into it, which changes colour if certain substances are present or absent in the pee. Alternatively, they may analyse your pee with a machine called the flow cytometer, which uses a laser beam to count particles in your urine. Both methods only provide indirect evidence of infection. The most reliable method that we can have is urine culture, where we leave this pee in a warm place and see if the bacteria that may be in it grows. This process, however, takes up to two days, which is way too long for our poor patient. So this, finally, brings me to our project. We're trying to use a technique called machine learning to bring all this information that's collected about the patient together and try and give any doctors a better test. My colleagues and I have developed such a computer program together with researchers at the University Hospital Birmingham, and we are quite happy with the results. Before we can use it in practice, however, we need to make sure that it really works. And so to this end, we're getting anonymous historic data from urinary tract infection patients at UCL hospitals to see how well our program would have worked here. We'll then use this additional knowledge to further improve our program and hopefully provide doctors with additional information that makes it easy for them to diagnose urinary tract infections using this P. Alert! Rise of the superbugs. What is antimicrobial resistance and where does it arise? First, healthy children have a healthy gut. The gut is the place where food is digested and where gut microbes reside. These are mainly bacteria, but also include viruses and fungi. Healthy children have a high diversity of gut bacteria because of healthy nutrition, um, such as vegetables, fruit and yogurt. This means that many different species of bacteria are present. You can imagine it to be like a lush garden with many different trees and flowers. So, a healthy and happy gut with happy microbes results in a healthy and happy baby. Secondly, however, diseases like cancer that require medication like antibiotics as well as chemo and radiotherapy damage the gut and lead to inflammation. This is enforced by malnutrition such as eating fast food high in sugar and fat. This all damages the gut and leads to a low diversity of gut microbes with only a few types of microbes left. Imagine the garden has dried out, most plants have died and left there only a few trees and cacti in a desert. That means that a sad gut equals disease. Thirdly, hereby antibiotics kill the good bacteria needed to protect the gut from the overgrowth of bad bacteria, which are also important for gut health itself. 
So only the bad bacteria survive that have developed antimicrobial resistance. These antimicrobial resistances serve as shields to protect the bad bacteria from the arrows of antibiotics and allow these bacteria to survive and dominate the gut of ill children and become superbugs. Nonetheless, it's important to stress that taking antibiotics is critical in many diseases and it's important to follow the instructions of doctors, especially finishing the antibiotics course until the end to prevent antimicrobial resistance development. Antimicrobial resistance is a huge global threat and we must stop the rise of resistant microbes to turn the desert back into the green garden again for better health. So let me ask you three different questions. So when was the last time you took an antibiotic, do you think? Did you know if it was the best one for the infection that you had? And do you think you really needed it? So research tells us that in about seven out of every 10 cases, the answer to at least two of those questions is no, you probably did not really need it. And no, it might not have been the best one for the infection that you had. So why do people have so many antibiotics? We know that patients expect a very high standard of care and we all reckon that when we visit the doctor, we like to go away with at least something in our hands, a prescription, some drugs, something like that, to make sure you, you've um, spent your money accordingly. However, in some countries, it's actually possible to bypass the doctors and just go and get those drugs without needing a prescription. So what you would do is you would walk into the equivalent of your local Tesco's or Sainsbury's, you would ask for a drug specifically for it by its name, and somebody will give it to you, so long as you're able to pay for it. Now, unfortunately, that is not a fantastic idea at all, mainly because you are almost certainly not buying the right type of drug for the bacteria that you need to kill. Huh? What was that that you said? Oh, you got better, did you? Well, you were lucky in that case. But actually, we need to be really, really careful with antibiotics. So every time you take a drug and you don't actually kill all of the bacteria, you give the rest of the bacteria an opportunity to survive, to divide and to remultiply, whilst at the same time, they can actually learn how to react to that drug. And this is what we call antibiotic resistance. And actually, um, if you look in the left hand side of the screen, this is what the, the uh, bacteria will start to do. They will guzzle up all of these drugs and will be in a situation where they no longer work. So in actually less than 30 years from now, we estimate that hundreds of millions of people will be carrying bacteria which is resistant to not one, not two, not five, but actually will be resistant to all of the antibiotics that we currently have. Um, so I don't know about you, but that actually sounds like a really, really scary scenario to me. So for example, if you have a child and your child likes to climb trees and he falls out of that tree, if he grazes his knee and some of that bacteria gets into the wound, we may be in a situation whereby if that wound now becomes effective, we will not have any weapons at all, which can kill the bacteria and help your child. What's really, really crazy as well is that there's actually a lot of different overlap between the drugs that both humans and animals take uh, when they're ill. So in the top right hand side of the screen now, you can see that whenever a doctor or a veterinarian prescribes drugs, it's usually based on experience alone because there's so many people in the world, so many animals in the world, there's not enough time to do testing for every single person, for every single animal. This means that in some of the cases, the drug which is given is not actually the appropriate drug. And this means that resistance can develop in either animals or in humans. The resistant bacteria can then actually be passed on from humans to other humans, for example, by sneezing on them or just being in close contact or, for example, not washing your hands uh, after you've used the toilet. Resistant bacteria can also be passed from your animals across to you. So, for example, if your dog gives you a nice big sloppy kiss in the morning, 
or for example if you eat some contaminated food products or meat products rather what's really interesting as well is that bacteria which uh, have resistance can also be transmitted between humans between animals and also between the environment and this can be in contaminated water or vegetables or crops so what my research focuses specifically on is how bacteria teach other bacteria to become resistant to antibiotics. So as I mentioned before, when some of the bacteria survives after you take a drug, what they can do is they can actually acquire a mutation. So this means that part of the genetic code, or in simple terms, part of the, um, the building blocks that make that bacteria can actually have a fundamental change. So that change is usually beneficial to the bacteria um, and it can allow it to resist the effects of different drugs. So these resistance mutations can actually be packaged up by the bacteria uh, in its genetic code, as you can see in the lower part of the screen, and it can be given to another bacteria. And when this bacteria uh, either eats or integrates this, um, this genetic code, it also learns what the previous bacteria has learned regarding resistance. And these little circles of DNA are called plasmids. So now because DNA is actually tiny, tiny, tiny and invisible completely to the naked eye, in order to find it, what we do is we often take stool or poop samples. We can isolate bacteria from these samples um, and then we pass it through um, a machine which can actually read the genetic code letter by letter and uh, spit it out uh, at the other end for us. What we can then do is we can actually locate these plasmids within the code and try and figure out who they're being passed from and who they're being passed to. So if we can figure out who is spreading the most of these plasmids, we can then actually better use limited resources to make targeted interventions in order to reduce the amount of antibiotics being used and hopefully reduce the amount of antibiotic resistance which is occurring in the world. Thank you. Hello, I'm Vicky Enney and I'm the Programme Manager for the NIHI funded INHALE study. Our aim is to investigate how rapid PCR based tests can improve diagnosis of pneumonia and antimicrobial prescribing. We are carrying out a clinical trial in which we have placed a test diagnosing the cause of hospital acquired pneumonia directly in 12 ICUs across the country. This test, called a biofire, can identify the cause of pneumonia in one hour as opposed to the standard two to three days it takes to grow the samples in a lab. This enables clinicians to select the correct antibiotic more quickly and thus they can avoid unnecessary antibiotic prescribing and AMR. Our research looks not only at the science but also at the economic and behavioural aspects of using this new technology. We are supported by a wonderful and enthusiastic patient and public involvement group who advise us on the research. For this festival, they have created a poem about the issue of AMR and how they think Inhale can help solve it. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Amanda Wellings, who will be performing the poem for us. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Vicky. The poem was put together by myself after asking for phrases and terms from the Inhale Patient Carer Involvement Group that I'm part of. I then wove the ideas into the technical and historical bits. I love being able to use poetry as a way of communicating complex ideas in a simple and hopefully enjoyable way. All the pictures in this video have been created by the children and grandchildren of the patient and public involvement group. The cat that may appear in various parts of this is called Rover and he appeared in my life as a stray and pops up every now and again into the world of work. So I thought I'd keep him in. He's part of my life. So where you get Amanda, you get Rover. If you like the poem, there are many more examples of my writing on a public Facebook page called Amanda's Poems. That's A-M-A-N-D-E-R apostrophe S poems. Do come and see them and leave comments. 
So here is the poem. Research study, inhale. Inhale deeply, please, as we take a poetical journey through pneumonia jug prescribing history. Embark here, please. Alexander Penicillin Fleming in 1945 foresaw his drugs not keeping us alive. Rise of resistant superbugs hard to kill with a simple antibiotic pill. Ration we must so effective longer, we the human race can keep stronger. Exhale please. We have aspirations. Nurse, take a spit sample away. Microbiologist, grow it in a day or days. We will know what ails you. In the meantime, this generic antibiotic should not fail you. Antibiotic, a simple pill, will cure many of our ills. Wait though, this causes stress, anxiety and perspiration. Try to inhale. Uncomfortable for you, I know. The stark reality. Lower respiratory tract infections, three million deaths worldwide, a third most common cause of death. Standard microbiological culture fails to reveal ails in three quarters of patients. We desperately need modern intervention to fight against antimicrobial resistance, our intention. Prescribing too many antibiotics is a sin. So, lesson time, know the cause, illnesses, we will win. Exhale please, think, try, test, true. In five years with 2.5 million NHS pounds, the inhale study will explore new grounds. Insert sample into the Biofire Magic Metagenomic Machine. In two hours, unveil the pathogens unseen. Cause specific pneumonia drugs can quickly work for you. Exhale, please. Pause the world on a COVID-19 break. Cease the broad spectrum antibiotic take. Inhale study stops as the world enters pandemic. Well, surely an answer could be academic. Covid patients with severe secondary infection cases fill ICUs. Inhale sites, load up your biofires. We need you. Substudy Covid biologist troops prepare. Use your PPE nurses, please take care. Infection calls clear quickly in black and white. Eureka rapid biofire can help Covid patients win this fight. Inhale please. Our study now proceeds fast paced. Thinking, trying, testing, true. Patient involvement in research design, making results fit you. I believe the dream research team will reach its destination. Biofire rapid diagnostics will serve the nation. We will help the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Doctors, hold the leeches. The evidence is nigh.